Hi, I'm Brady Forrest uh, with O'Reilly Media. Welcome to the New York edition of Launchpad. Uh, this morning we're going to have five great companies presenting. They're each going to be showing off their product. In many cases, these are launches. And what we're trying to figure out here today is which product has the best chance of success. So each company will get five minutes on stage. We'll be cutting them off right at five minutes. I have a thing for that. And after that, we'll have some discussion with our three judges who will be paying attention. Right, Barry Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> and our judges this morning from left to right are Nate Westheimer of New York Tech Meetup, an advisor to Flybridge Capital and co-founder of Anyclip, Baratunde Thurston of The Onion, Jack and Jill Politics, and Sci-Fi's Future Of, or Pop Size Future Of, and Karen Klein of SoftBank Capital. So an entrepreneur, a pundit, and a VC. This to my name, thank you. <laughs> an entrepreneur. So you're an entrepreneur too. Yes. <laughs> and I have one business to my name too, so that kind of makes me an entrepreneur as well. So feel free to participate in the conversation with them. We're not going to do formal uh, audience questions. We won't have time for that because we're trying to keep things on a tight schedule. But definitely, it's a small room. We can have a community atmosphere to it. Uh, the five companies we'll be hearing from are Abstrata, EarthAid. Food Spotting, Neighborhooder, and Setjam. We'll be starting off with Abstrata, which is represented by Michael Liss and Ryan Murray. Please welcome up Abstrata. Well, good morning. Uh, we're Abstrata. We're a New York City based, self funded startup, and uh, this is our first public presentation of a service, and so we are really jazzed to be here. Uh, we've been working for over a year on this service, and we are now live with an alpha version on the Amazon uh, cloud. Uh, so hopefully uh, you can come by and take a look. Uh, we want to talk to developers, and specifically we want to talk to rich client developers. So if you are a developer developing in JavaScript or Flash Flex, or if you're writing for a mobile app environment like iPhone or um, Blackberry, then we want to talk to you today. Um, as a rich client developer, um, your thing is you can make user experiences sing and dance. Uh, and ideally, what you're working on and spending your time on is your app, and you're not managing plumbing, you're not managing servers. But there's a train coming down the track that's going to change some of that, and that's the real-time web. The real-time web is going to uh, require you to put your application data in a place that's available for real-time integration with other services uh, out on the web. And that means servers. So what are you going to do? Um, we think you should use the Abstrata Data Hub. It's the data hub for the real-time web. Uh, and you can think of the Abstrata Data Hub as kind of a rich cloud service, which complements the rich environments that are now available in browsers and on mobile apps. We've layered on a whole lot of special sauce that makes it uh, really easy for you to integrate your app into the real-time web without having to manage dedicated or custom servers. You can store anything in the Abstrata uh, data hub, including uh, large digital files like audio and video, and it has integrated uh, access security right down to the field level. Um, you can get at the, the uh, data hub from any device and any application because it's a, a, a RESTful interface. So any application on any device that can speak HTTP can get at our data service. And then the Abstrata Data Hub, uh, you can set up automatic pushes of, of data once they're in the hub out to other services in kind of a web hooky type of way. And you can even publish <coughs> custom APIs so that third party apps that you don't write can um, uh, push to you or pull from your data. Uh, really easy, very powerful, uh, no dedicated servers. Now, there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, and what we've done is we've created a, a real simple demo app so we, we can kind of illustrate for you how this might work in practice. Uh, it's live on our website, so you can go take a look uh, and try it out. And Ryan is going to uh, take you through and, and, and show you how that works. OK, let's take a look at the special sauce. Here we have a client-side JavaScript application. This is talking directly to the live Abstrata service in the cloud. When we submit our vote here on our survey, this is going to 
automatically push and create a new document in the App Strata service. And our, then our client UI is going to pull back an aggregate query, show us the current results of the survey. But what's more interesting is if we go over to Twitter here and we refresh the page, you'll see that when that survey was submitted, our App Strata account was actually DM'd to let us know that we had a submit. Now, I want to take a look and see a bit how that happens. Okay, in this graph, the interesting part is the script that's fired off when the document is submitted to the database. So that script is able to access the data in the database, find out who owns that survey, get their Twitter ID, and fire off the direct message using Twitter's API. Now, we've used Twitter as a very simple example because it's easy today in the real-time environment, but you can be doing something much more complex. You could be taking a video file which has been uploaded into the AppStrata data hub and pushing that out to encoding.com to maybe generate thumbnails or create other formats. Another important part, this script is triggered based on a data action in the hub, but this script can also be published, as Mike mentioned, as a custom API. That allows developers to go ahead and expose additional functionality than the basic AppStrata functionality that's needed for their application. That exposed script API could be a webhook receiving point, which has full access to the data in the data hub, or it could be used uh, to create additional APIs for the rich client or third-party apps. Here on the client side, we can see very simple code, two lines of JavaScript. We push data in right from our HTML form with one line. We take it back out with one line of JavaScript for a query. The server side script, again, very simple. Three lines of JavaScript code. We can find out who owns that survey. We can get their Twitter username and use Twitter's HTTP API to push that out. You know, at AppStrata, we think that the real-time web is really going to be about live, open, dynamic data. So with a lightweight, scriptable API running on top of our data hub, which is a scalable cloud-based service, it couldn't be easier to build applications for the real-time web. You know, those applications are a few lines of JavaScript, they're rich client front ends, and they're running on a pay-as-you-grow managed service. You know, no messing with servers, no messing with backups, and hopefully no messing with scalability when your application is far more successful than you thought it would be. We'd love you to come and visit us on our website, developer.appstrata.com has additional examples, some more information, as well as some developer tools for managing your scripts and your schemas and other assets. We have this example on appstrata.com.vote. And of course, at our blog, all of our news will be coming out there. Mike said we just launched. We would love for you guys to come and join the conversation. We think the AppStrata Data Hub is going to be a critical part of the evolution of the real-time web, and we want to hear from you about that. Thanks a lot. So is the Abstrata Data Hub open source? And if it's not, how do you deal with you know, fears from developers of being tied to your proprietary system? Sure. So the Data Hub itself is a service. So it's not software. So it's not itself open source. Uh, like any service, there's an incredible value in time to market to being able to get up fast and not have to worry about deploying managing software and servers. Of course, the idea of a lock-in exists. The important part is that's your data, and you can export that data at any time. There's no sort of proprietary metadata that's being hidden behind the scenes. Everything is open to you. That same query we showed could suck everything back out. So we're very committed to keeping an open environment, and people's data is their own data. We're just offering you the service. I mean, I think, you know, you're tapping into a really interesting, powerful uh, segment. I mean, dynamic data, real-time web, um, there's a lot of momentum and mm -hmm. interest in that. What I'd be curious about is how do you refine or present your marketing message so that you come across with credibility? You know, once you talk about data, there's a lot of concerns around security. Now, we don't have time to necessarily go into, you know, the levels of security that you have, but I'd be curious, how do you sell an audience like this one mm -hmm that you're going to be able to provide five nines and that their data is secure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you know, being constrained to five minutes, uh, you can't exactly. really touch on that. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that we, we actually ha are uniquely uh, positioned for security. We actually are the only data store that, that we know about or database that actually has integrated security right down to the field level that, that the developer has control of. Um, but uh, you know, we think when we get to more targeted audiences, like uh, we might have a little bit more to say about specifically about the iPhone, you know, in a longer presentation than just the, the rich client. So, we'll, in 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 more extended conversations, it'll be a little bit more focused about the value add that we have for you as an iPhone developer versus you as a JavaScript developer. Uh, to I just want to add one thing. Yeah. Also, 
the service is running in the Amazon cloud, so we also have behind us an awful lot of very powerful and secure technology that we're working with. So we haven't invented everything from scratch. Uh, how did you? How do you make money? And how did you choose that adorable little chicky as your logo? <laughs> it's really cute, and it makes me want to use whatever you make. So, uh, so the the chick's not really a logo. That was just fun but for it is now. for. for <laughs> Did you for, get the chickies permission? It was kind of a launch thing, you okay. know. Uh, but uh, I we kind of like the mean look in his eye. Um, uh, the uh, would you ask me how do we make money? So yes. we're we're a pay a pay for a service. So uh, it, so we we tend to get confused with software, that, um, but we're not software. We're 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 a, a, a web service where uh, you sign an account and you it's. Um, there are tiers of use, kind of like a like a like a mobile service, mm -hmm. and you, you buy in for as much uh, activities you think you're going to do. So you know, the, it, right now it's free; it's just alpha. But uh, eventually, we will charge for it. So the bigger, the more. But it's a pay pays you grow thing. So the more you use, the more you pay. The, if you only use a little bit, there's always going to be a free tier for. for What's the measurement? What's the variable of use? Uh, it's it's kind of three points. Uh, so we're we're an API. So it's it's API calls. So calls okay. All right. Uh, file transfers and uh, storage. Right. It's pretty simple. Okay. One last question. Um, so we've seen you know in the past MySQL acquired by, uh, gosh, that was Sun, Sun. right? And um, you know, for for what you've built, who's a natural sort of acquirer? Or, or do you really see this as, you know, your own company? I mean, you've built on top of Amazon. I, w I wonder if there's some thinking there about being acquired. Well, we're, you know, we're just trying to build a business right now. We haven't thought about uh, acquisition. I mean, it's a natural question. But, but uh, you know, the, the bigger companies that are uh, going to start generating their revenue from cloud services would be a natural uh, fit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Google, Amazon, somebody like that would would certainly look at this because what we're doing is we're adding value to kind of uh, we're, we're raising the uh, we used to have a tagline called the higher layer which is basically you know the the the, the cloud is kind of starting at infrastructure and then we've moved up to maybe database layers but those are the same sort of layers that you do in in a, in a normal environment what we're doing is is kind of turning the cloud into another layer of abstraction, a more powerful layer, where you don't even really need to worry about the underlying software or the underlying servers. So we think that the natural evolution of, of the cloud, uh, along with the web going real time, is the cloud will move to higher layers of abstraction. And I think we're leading the charge there. So uh, we, would, we would think that we might be attractive for some larger company to do that. All right, thank you very much, Ryan and Michael. Next up, hailing from DC, I'd like to welcome EarthAid's Ben Bixby. Okay. Thank you very much, Brady. Uh, it is uh, truly an honor, <coughs> excuse me, an honor to uh, have the opportunity to share the stage with uh, all these fine startups. I'm looking into becoming a client, at least of several of them, I already know. I uh, wanted to introduce you to EarthAid for those of you following along at home. That's uh, EarthAid.net, uh, Twitter at EarthAid. We are live in public beta today. What do we do? EarthAid is the mint.com for your utilities and the mint.com for energy. Uh, value propositions, we can link all of your utility accounts in one place, electric, gas, and water, irrespective of whether these are served by different utilities. There's a lot you can learn by looking at them uh, you know, not in isolation, but all together in the same place. We also automatically uh, find and uh, serve up to you all the federal, state, local, utility level incentives and rebate programs that are, uh, make it easier for you to save energy uh, and save money while saving energy. And uh, perhaps most revolutionary, in my opinion, uh, EarthAid gives you points for saving energy. We built the first ever rewards program for saving energy and water. Uh, and you can, at any point, exchange those points uh, for a whole bunch of great uh, goods and services from our partners all around the country. Uh, it's a growing list. Uh, this is sort of meant to really uh, not only uh, reward the people who are inclined to save energy anyway, but you know the folks who aren't joining EarthAid because they love data, 
and the folks who aren't joining EarthAid because they love the polar bears, you know, these folks can uh, join EarthAid because they love cupcakes. You can earn free cupcakes for saving energy only at EarthAid. Uh, and a whole lot more. Um, the approach that we're taking to data is also uh, somewhat different. We're making it possible to liberate your utility data streams. The old way that folks go about this is partnering with utilities. There's a lot of problems with this. You gotta get through the bureaucracy. You gotta get through the uh, utility IT infrastructure, which is a whole barrel of uh, fun in and of itself. And you gotta get through the regulators who also have differing opinions on whether or not the utility should actually allow you access to your data and allow you to get better use of it. Uh, what we do is we partner with you. Uh, so this makes it possible for EarthAid, uh, for you to come to EarthAid to link your utility accounts once and forever and ever we keep all of your data up to date for you. Uh, just to sort of contrast the relative merits of these approaches, uh, Microsoft, you may know, launched Home in June. It's a fine product uh, and they just uh, linked up uh, with uh, Seattle Public Utilities. So your Seattle City Light account, you can now link to uh, home. They did that through the utility. Just earlier this week, they added their second utility partner, Excel Energy. Remember, they launched in June. Uh, now, this is a, a very good thing to do to actually automate data. Uh, if you look at carbon calculators on the web where you have to go and input your own data yourself, people come to these, even social carbon calculators, but they don't come back. The data doesn't update itself. There's no u useful insights for you unless you come back. And of course, there's a little bit of the question of the liar's game of you know, whether or not I decide to impress my friends by saying I live in an apartment where I have 999 wind turbines and therefore I'm greener than you all. Uh, EarthAid, uh, like Microsoft, shares this view that actual data is very important. We've seen our results by actually automating the retrieval of data in our system. 72% of our users come back. This makes sense because we're pushing the data out to you. We let you know when there's new information at EarthAid, we let you know what it means, and we let you know how this uh, impacts you know, new ways to save and whether or not you've earned any cupcakes on that basis, or whether or not you can. Now, uh, rather than going, as I mentioned, rather than going through the utilities, EarthAid goes through you. So this has enabled us to sort of move a little bit faster than some of these other players. Uh, Microsoft is now compatible with two utilities. EarthAid, we launched uh, into very quietly into public beta uh, back in early, uh, in uh, late May actually, just uh, in advance of home. And as you can see, we are actually a little bit further. I want to announce today uh, that we, I want to announce today that we are compatible with our 100th utility, but we just couldn't help ourselves last night. We actually added six more. So it's, uh, EarthAid is now compatible with 106 utilities uh, announcing here at Launchpad today. Just walk you through how it works. You uh, link your, oh, this is the other big thing we're launching today. Now saving energy is social with EarthAid. You can uh, link with your uh, Facebook account and you can use EarthAid's uh, premier Facebook app to actually share your energy consumption information with your friends if you choose to. It can also remain entirely private. You can be completely invisible on the system. Uh, just gonna show you this is how you link your accounts. If you don't already have your account, you can go through there. So it looks like we show you how much, help you track how well you're doing. All those numbers keep up to date, your carbon footprint, you can look at your gas, you can look at your electric, you can look in bar graphs if you like, you can compare to your friends, you know, as I mentioned, here on, uh, if you choose to use our Facebook app, you can share this information automatically, uh, challenge your friends, to save more energy, uh, I can show them how you're actually earning rewards for saving energy to inspire them. Uh, you can also track, you know, how much money you're spending on energy, it's another great motivation to save. Uh, we show you tips, we highlight incentives in your area, uh, automatically grab right there all the incentives that are applicable to you, products that can help you save energy, you earn points. All right, Ben. And that's rewards and the yeah. end. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you captured another very compelling trend. Everyone wants to be, you know, conscious of uh, being more mindful of saving the world if we can through reducing our energy spend. I guess I have a couple of questions. I mean, sure. there's a lot of moving pieces, but uh, maybe it'd be helpful to tell us a little bit of how you plan to make you know, money. Are you charging a fee to the users? Sure. Are you taking a percentage of savings? We, we never charge a fee to our users. It's uh, completely free to participate in EarthAid, uh, both as a user as well as a small business who wants to offer rewards to people who are saving energy. Uh, you know, sort of, we create this cycle of sustainability where we actually and send people to recirculate their utility bill savings back into the local economy through folks who are rewarding them to save energy. Um, completely free there. We make money on uh, the basis of lead generation for a lot of the projects where you can save energy at home. 
uh, as well as uh, product sales, both through affiliates. We'll also be launching a new tool soon where in deregulated utility markets, just like Mint.com helped you find uh, better credit card offers, EarthAid can find you cleaner and cheaper uh, energy rate plans in certain deregulated states. About 41% of the US population lives in those areas, so we'll also uh, be making money uh, on the basis of connecting folks with those plans. So that's well. the piece I was curious about because, like in the case of Mint, they're in a market that's ripe for lead gen. I mean, the you know the different ecosystem providers you know will pay a large amount for customers. Sure. When when one thinks about energy, you don't necessarily think about the government you know giving kickbacks to people. <laughs> right, but to, we, to incentives, say, not yeah, kickbacks. Incentives, sure, incentives, sure, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's also dirty. <laughs> There, there are actually 1,800 different incentive programs in the, in the Earth Aid database of different federal, state, local, utility level rebate programs. There's quite a bit, and most folks don't know that they're out there. That's why uh, rather than making you Google them, rather than making you search or sort through them, when you sign up for Earth Aid, we automatically highlight the utility, uh, federal, state, local uh, incentive programs that are applicable to you on your dashboard so you find out, wow, I could get $500 for replacing my refrigerator. Oh, and that's also going to save me several hundred dollars. And then again, cupcakes are in it for me at the end. So, you know, if, if not for that and for the polar bears, then I'll change the refrigerator for the cupcakes. So it seems though in this space, which I think is incredibly interesting, um, there are a couple different layers or di you know, different points of entry uh, for the consumer. One would be sort of on the bill level or just total amount of energy consumed or utilities consume, and then there are also folks who are trying to go in on the appliance level. You just mentioned you know, replacing your refrigerator, but right. how would you ever know that it's your refrigerator that needs to be replaced by looking at, at uh, what you're doing? So are you, are you thinking about working with other companies in this space or developing your own products in this space? Uh, we, we're committed to remaining a software play. You know, n neither any user nor any utility ever has to purchase or install any software or hardware to use EarthAid. Uh, and there's a lot that you can do by looking at the data both at a monthly resolution. You know, we can deduce what the base load in your home is so we know if you're using more uh, on that basis. We can also, uh, where available, as the smart grid rolls up, EarthAid's grabbing data at whatever resolution it's available. So in some cases it's monthly, in some cases it's daily, in some cases it's hourly. And it's getting there to the 15 minute uh, and 15 second uh, variety. Just the difference in our approach is you know, rather than waiting around, uh, to let the utility give us access to this. We're sort of leveraging their existing infrastructure to pull data today, make it more useful for folks, sniff out which appliances uh, are responsible for which loads, and help people find a way to save that you know, ultimately uh, makes an economic difference for them immediately, environmental difference uh, for all of us, and again, you know, free cupcakes. <laughs> I like uh, data, I hate paper. And I like visibility and sort of personal informatics. You guys are playing to that trend as well. What I want to know is, you know, the scale of this will be a part of its success. How are you driving customer adoption? Um, and you made a note about local businesses kind of rewarding people who are saving energy. What's their incentive to do that? Uh, in addition to doing a good thing, uh, you... Uh, that doesn't get, count. <laughs> <laughs> no, you get, you get people in the door. Okay. Uh, if you're giving out the free cupcake, maybe they're also purchasing a sandwich. You know, if you're giving, uh, uh, the, I think we have one partner in Philadelphia, a spa that's giving an hour-long massage. You know, maybe you, maybe you like it so much you come back. There are okay. $25 gift cards. Maybe you're going to spend $50 there. It's, uh, it's in everybody's interest to participate. Everybody wins. Everybody saves. Um, we actually will also be having our first national brands coming online, hopefully by the end of the first quarter next year. A couple interesting discussions going on there. Okay. So we're, we will be scaling along uh, with some, some co-marketing efforts on behalf of those folks. And you know, the evangelization, hopefully, of folks in the crowd here today would uh, certainly appreciate. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Next up, we have a service that uh, helps you find that perfect meal. Please welcome up Alexander Anderje Alec Alexa Anderjeski of Food Spotting. Hi, I'm Alexa, and I'm a user experience designer from Adaptive Path. But today, I'm excited to be launching my own startup, Food Spotting, here at the Web 2.0 Expo. Food Spotting is a visual local guide that lets you find dishes instead of just restaurants. So I came up with this idea for food spotting when I first visited Japan and Korea a year ago. 
I discovered all these dishes I'd never heard of before, like okonomiyaki and tteokbokki. When I came back to San Francisco, I mined existing local guides in search of these dishes, only to find that they were too broad or too unstructured when it came to looking for a specific dish. So I set out to create a new local guide that harnesses what food lovers are already doing, like taking pictures of their food everywhere and showing off their expertise, <coughs> to create a rich collection of foods and where to find them. Food spotters can report sightings of foods that they love, which enables food seekers to find whatever they're craving and to see what's good at a specific restaurant. Spotting a food is as easy as taking a picture and saying what it is and where you found it, like this chocolate chip cookie from Levain that I had the other day. Food spotters are rewarded for making quality contributions to food spotting. Whenever somebody wants or bookmarks or votes up the food that they spotted, they earn reputation points. The more reputation points they earn, the more foods they can vote up. So it's trying to build more credibility into the rating system. This enables food seekers to find the best of whatever dish they're craving. So you can look up the best burger in New York. It also enables you to look up a specific restaurant and see all of the foods that are good there. So it's like a picture menu for any restaurant. You can also have a picture menu for any neighborhood. If you look up East Village, for example, you can see pictures of all the foods that are nearby. And this is especially compelling on the iPhone app, which we're working on as well. So while we have several possible revenue streams, the one we're most excited about is this. Restaurants can pay to post special dishes and special offers, and we want to make that just as easy as spotting a food. Instead of just writing them on their blackboard, where they'll only be seen by people who are already at the restaurant, they can post them to food spotting, where they'll be seen by nearby hungry food seekers, who currently have no other way to get this kind of real-time restaurant food information from all the restaurants nearby. Food spotting is not just for serious foodies. Anybody who uses the internet to make dining decisions will benefit from this visual way of browsing food. To make this happen, the first thing we need to do is engage food spotters. And to do this, we're adding a game-like dimension to the things that they're already doing. So it's kind of like the four square for food. We also want to encourage them, and it's kind of inherently social, to share their sightings on Twitter and on Facebook. And if you look up food spotting, you'll see a lot of food sightings already from our alpha users. Doing this will attract food seekers who will see these sightings. And we're also developing partnerships with food bloggers and food magazines to create expert recommendations and to sponsor food scavenger hunts. Finally, we can attract restaurants by showing them that their dishes are on food spotting and encouraging them to, them to post their specials and special offers. Unlike existing local and travel guides, food spotting is visual and it's focused. It's just about the food. This focus and simplicity is the one thing that's challenging for established food sites to replicate because many of them are already doing so many things. Being user experience driven will also set food spotting apart. Um, as a user experience designer for Adaptive Path, I've helped companies like MySpace and SmartFM reimagine their products from idea to implementation. And my co-founder, Ted Grubb, was the front end engineer behind Get Satisfaction. We look forward to following in the footsteps of our colleagues and advisors like Peter Merholtz, Jeff Bean, and Lane Becker, who've started UX driven companies like Get Satisfaction, Measure Map, and Typekit. So we're excited to be opening up our alpha to the public kind of in a friends and family launch, or like a word of mouth launch at the Web 2.0 here today. So uh, and we, have, we want to launch our iPhone app before the end of the year, and it, we actually have a version of that that's ready to share with alpha testers. Uh, we plan to close our first round of funding early next year so that we can build the full version of the iPhone app and begin reaching out to restaurants. And uh, in the second quarter of next year, we hope to continue to hire and build our team. Until then, I'd love it if all of you could help us get started here in New York and sign up for our alpha at foodspotting.com slash I love food. And feel free to share this link with your food-loving friends and family. And if you'd like to know more, please contact me at alexa at foodspotting.com, and I'd love to talk afterwards. Thank you. Okay, um, first of all, <clears throat> your timing was perfect. You had like six seconds left. That was a great presentation. All right, thank you. Um, I love food. I think most people, we need it to live, so that's pretty good. There are two challenges that I see I'd love to your response to. One is, 
um, how many apps and services do you expect end users and consumers and citizens to use on a regular basis? You know, you say the Foursquare of well, I use Foursquare, I use the Yelp app, I'm gonna need like a concentric circle of apps to manage my you know, cultural life. Um, and how do you manage uh, menu changes at restaurants? You know, keeping the database up to date is hard enough when businesses change, their menus may change weekly. Right, so to your first question, we're actually hoping to talk to companies like Foursquare about integrating with their services and we're planning to build an open API for food spotting. So we hope to make it as integrated with the existing ecosystem of social sites as we can. Um, it's already connected to Twitter, we're working on Facebook. Um, and, we, and with sites like Foursquare, we'd love to be integrated and not competing with these existing sites. Um, so that it could automatically post like these food sightings as tips on Foursquare. Um, to your second question, we're hoping it will all be powered by the crowd, but part of it will be just about getting that kind of latest information from a restaurant. So you can see we tag the photos with the date that it was taken as opposed to the date that you posted it. So you can see if that photo was relatively new or mm -hmm. something older, you know, if people are still spotting it or if it was only spotted once. Um, and of course we're gonna have the you know, standard flagging and you know, saying this isn't here anymore. So this kind of the latest and the best are two possible views. Okay. Right, food well, wars! Oh, yeah, exactly. That's awesome! Food fight. <laughs> um, we could have a like, food fight app where you vote for the best picture out of the two, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, so we're hoping to bubble up the photos to the top that get the most attention. So the, mo the pictures that are viewed the most by users or that people like and vote up will be um, the ones that are surfaced. At the same time, um, because the reputation system anyway is based on uh, you know, having a limited number of ratings, so you can't just go in and like give ratings to all of your stuff. You have to actually be a food spotter and continue to earn points to post more ratings. Um, and as far as the pictures, again, it's going to be crowdsourced. You know, people can flag it as a bad photo or you know, not not a real photo of the thing. And we're hoping that you know, food spotters who care about that restaurant will care enough to flag the photos that are inappropriate. Is it only a positive site, like, or can negative? Yeah, worst pictures, food in yeah, New York. oh, this, is, this was a horrible meal. Right, so while this has been something we've debated a lot, one of our core values is that people don't care about the foods you hate. They wanna know what you love. So when you log into food spotting, you're not gonna assumption. see the foods that people hate. Yeah. <laughs> I, the the I don't know, there's a lot of haters in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, so it's kind of like a dig model, so I mean we could throw in a berry down the road. But right now we're hoping that people will promote the foods that they love and those will rise to the top. Yeah, like a rotten tomato. And then I had one quick, uh, well maybe, so I was curious, I mean part of it, g leveraging what Bertandi was saying is, you know, we have so many different apps, we only have so much time. I'd be curious as to what elements of gameplay you're gonna incorporate to make this more engaging and differentiated from some of the other types of apps that are currently on our iPhones and right. libraries. So this is really optimized for people who want to collect and show off their expertise in the food space. So you can become the ex you can become the champion of a certain dish, you know, very Foursquare like way. But you can be the one who's tried more hamburgers than anybody, or you can be the person who's tried more okonomiyaki than anybody. If you're something, you know, you want to show off something more niche. Um, so there's kind of we're appealing to that desire to collect things and to show off your expertise in food. Um, we're also planning to have food scavenger hunts where um, people magazines like. The New York Times or 7x7 in San Francisco can sponsor a list of foods, and the people who finish the most of that list will, you know, be, be rewarded by that food food partner. Um, I think it's great, and I think that I would only use it if it was integrated with other services that I currently use. So I, I wish you the best in in getting into those services because I totally see it and buy into it. But to to Baratunde's point how much more can I, I pay attention to on a, on a daily basis. Um, the, I'm, I'm very interested in the, in the interactions that you're gonna have with uh, restaurants. And if this is the core of your, your business model, uh, no matter how well you do on the user side, if you don't get this part right, um, well, you could be like another startup and find another way of, of making money, but uh, I would hope that you could do it this way. So it's, it's part question, which is how do you plan on addressing it, and then part advice, which is to look at startups like uh, menu pages uh, and other sort of very data uh, restaurant-oriented services that have spent a lot of time, and I recommend that you spend a lot of time, you know, really getting that process down. It's all about sort of process, uh, 
because you know it could be that the best Vietnamese sandwich is at a place that doesn't even have a fax machine, let alone have an iPhone to post uh, the Vietnamese sandwich. Right, so um, Just real quick. I, yeah, I realize we're out of time, um, and I'll try to answer all your questions in person when I can. But um, I, though I, I'm a user experience researcher and strategist by background, so I mean we're actually planning to do a lot more research on our business model before we do it, and to go talk to restaurant owners and see what their challenges are and see how we could make this integrate with their real lives. Um, at the same time, I think that what makes this what makes this uniquely valuable to restaurants is that it's easy. Because right now, to post or advertise on Yelp, you've got to call up their sales team, you've got to work you know work out an advertising package that suits your restaurant. It costs a lot of money. We want to make this as easy as posting on Craigslist. Like you pay a little fee, you post your special. And we're hoping that that will actually fit better into restaurants' lives than um, kind of the more advertising-driven model. Okay. Food Thank you very Thank you so much, and I'd love to answer your questions afterwards. now. Uh, next up, Hyper, Hyper Local Blog Network, Neighborhooder, represented by Anthony DeRosa and Richard Blakely. Thank you. Good morning. So uh, what is Neighborhooder? Neighborhooder is a reader-generated blog network where anyone can quickly and easily post about what's happening in their neighborhood without having to log in or register. So say you live in New York City and you live in the East Village and you want to check out the East Village blog. Well, you go to East Village and you can scroll down, they just took the uh, scaffolding off this building, and sure, it's probably not of interest to most people in New York City, but if you live in uh, the East Village, it is. Um, it's all um, content either curated through the Tumblr network or um, people in the neighborhood submitting. So here's a video of a guy who um, has been standing outside of uh, Ruben's empanadas and cussing at people. <laughs> He's just a bum. He's like in dropping f bombs left and right. Not very interesting for the great majority of people, but like if you live across from Rubens and this is a problem, um, you're going to be interested in it. So um, you find your neighborhood, and if you want to submit something, you use Tumblr's easily um, submit form. And let's just say McSorley's is the best. Say submit a photo of. McSorley's, which is um, my favorite bar. Bar in the East Village. Boom. And you accept the terms, and you submit. And then it goes away into a queue. And um, currently, we have 60 neighborhoods. And most of them, are, um, well, about 20 of them now are moderated by community managers. And where does this go now? Um, the community manager has a dashboard. And these are all on the right here. You can see all of our neighborhoods. And the numbers indicate um, how many posts have, are, are new. And you can just go to the East Village. And this is what the community moderator sees. And oh, look, there's two submissions. And all they have to do is say, oh, this is a great one. Let's publish it. And you can go back to East Village Neighborhooder, and there it is. So it's very simple, and you don't even need to have like a Tumblr account to use it. And um, speaking of food, um, I'm also the, the co-founder of uh, This Is Why You're Fat. And we're basically using, we use the form. It's, uh, the reason it's so successful is because they're all exclusive stuff that people have made. So we have this, the toaster orgy. Um, I don't know if you guys, have, yeah. Here's Cheetos with like uh, strawberry yogurt. Um, but the, its success is based solely on this user submitted thing, and now we're just applying it to hyperlocal. Yeah, so I think what makes us unique in the hyperlocal space, which is a pretty crowded space, it's, it's a hot area right now, is the fact that we are pulling in uh, content directly from this stream uh, that can easily be whittled down by us. Uh, there's search functions built into the interface, so we can go and we can find out what's in the stream for the East Village. And it's just one click away to take that stuff from the stream and put it onto the, uh, to the main neighborhood page. Um, we're not data driven, we're not just pulling in RSS feeds, we're pulling in relevant content. And we have community managers which are curating that content, so it's not like we're just you know, throwing data at you or just scraping uh, RSS feeds from around the internet. So it's a very, 
very highly relevant uh, data for these neighborhoods. So yeah, um, Tumblr has a great search function and um, it would be impossible. The reason um, I came up with this, like I was in um, Prospect Park South and there was a great community blog and then all of a sudden the guy who was running it moved and then no more community blog. I'm like, well this is horrible. Like uh, there needs to be, uh, I, I wish I could have taken it over or a community could take it over but I don't have time to do, to run a blog. So um, if this is all, this is all ground up, user submitted, um, it's very easy in Tumblr to just say, hey, this is a great post, reblog. Just go to the East Village and reblog the post. Now it would have taken like five or 10 minutes maybe to write that post, and instead you just reblog it. That's it. That's it, that's pretty simple. <laughs> All right. Um, nice. No, so you, it's a very lightweight. I mean, one of the things I like about this is that it's it's super lightweight, right? I mean, you didn't even. It's not even built on WordPress, right? It's built on Tumblr. You couldn't have done less. <laughs> um, which is, less is took a which long is, time to set which is, less. which is a good thing, or can be a good thing. Um, and, and really, no better two people could have you know come up with this. No, Nobody knows more about user-generated content and local blogs than you know you two. But you know, I, I want to hear from you, and we haven't really heard from you guys yet about this product. You know, where does it go? Um, is this something that you think can scale to a billion things, or is this a lifestyle? Hey, cool, Soup and and Richard <laughs> have you know neighborhood are going on, but they're also doing you know working at their, their current job. So is this gonna be a big startup and, and how does it get there? We want it to be. I think uh, we're really trying to tap into the community and we want this to be as user driven as possible. Um, we already have 15 community managers. and We've only been around for like two months. Yeah. Like, and, and it's been overwhelming, the response has been great. Um, yeah, Tumblr is a very simple platform but um, it's really powerful and you can have as many sub things in your dashboard which makes it awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, and again, by tapping into the community, I mean, it would be difficult for the two of us to just manage this on our own, but there's all this, the, the utilities at our, uh, at our fingertips by having all that data in the stream and having community managers, and people are highly engaged in this. I mean, we, we get a lot of requests uh, through emails for people that want to manage their neighborhoods. You have people in other parts of the country that are like, you know, when are you coming to LA? When are you coming to San Francisco? Uh, I've gotten requests from people overseas. So there are people that want to manage this content. They're already on Tumblr, they're already uh, reblogging tons of content, but they don't have something like Neighborhooder uh, in their area that can you know, highlight that stuff. So we're trying to get that and, to and, them. And to answer your question, um, is this just a project for us? Um, it took us a couple weeks to build it, and um, there's no overhead, and it pretty much runs itself. So we're just gonna see, we hope that people use it and find it of interest, and uh, if they do, then it's a success. I, uh, I love how you said you didn't have time to become a blog manager for your neighborhood, but you built a business instead. <laughs> um, one of the peculiar possibilities of this is a very skewed perspective on neighborhoods, because it only is applicable to the types of people who use Tumblr. You start, you know, it's got a Brooklyn hub, it's got a very New Yorky feel, and you have to under, and Tumblr's a weird service, which isn't intuitive. Mm -hmm. Like, what is that? Whereas there's a lot of local content on a MySpace or a Facebook that would reach other demographics and age groups, how do you address what the neighborhood looks like through Neighborhooder? This is why your fat was also on Tumblr, but anyone coming to it would never know unless they were logged into Tumblr, you would see the thing in the upper right hand corner. And it was very successful because it had the user submit form and that was like the key behind all of it. If you don't have a Tumblr, you don't know this is here. Now, our page views are horrible right now. Um, that's because most of the people using the service are from Tumblr. So I honestly believe that the user submitter form is like the wave of the future as far as turning editorial top down in blogging. And um, I think it's about a year or two out before, like I feel like people just figured out the power of blogs and how to use them. Um, and I think it's gonna be another year or two before they realize the power of the user submit form. And I think, um, you know, Gawker's doing it now. You can submit your own post on Gawker. Um, this is why you're fat. There's a couple other Tumblr blogs. HuffPo. Um, just think of all, like, even Wikipedia, they have community managers and it's like user generated, you name it. Um, and it just hasn't really applied yet. So I think there's going to be a crossroad with hyperlocal 
um, wanting not just data, actual stories about your neighborhood, and um, that's going to be, I still think it's like about a year or two out before people actually, to answer your question, it really doesn't matter that it's on Tumblr or not. Yeah. It's just an added benefit. For example, if you're on Tumblr, you can follow the neighborhood where you work and the neighborhood where you live or some place you're interested in moving to. Um, but if not, you can just use the RSS feed or something. And then will you guys talk a little bit, I know we've kind of danced around, but how you, how you ultimately, I mean, ad-supported businesses has to get to crazy volume. And then even, you know, do you have any concerns about the content? I know it's being curated, but as you balloon to that volume, you know, what are the revenue streams that you kind of foresee? I mean, I'm a little bit more of a capitalist than Richard is. He kind of just sees it as, you know, we'll throw it out there. It's a community service. People use it great. If they don't, they don't. But I think if this thing does gain a lot of momentum and a lot of people uh, start to use it, um, you know, those are, those are a ton of eyeballs and they're very focused on those neighborhoods. So the thing about advertising is you want to get into really niche markets and um, you want to have people that opt into that. So although we get a lot of our uh, folks coming to the site from outside the Tumblr network, folks that are inside the Tumblr network are following those neighborhoods. So it's like an opt-in subscription so the, that's a more valuable viewer than somebody that's just going to a website. So we can sell that to an advertiser. So eventually we're thinking maybe you have sponsored posts. Very transparent that those are sponsored posts. Um, and that's yeah, one that's, way we could drive revenue. Yeah, that shows, up, that, that shows up not only on the blog but in people's dashboard, which is like direct. So it's more like the opt-in mail thing than it is um, having to go back and seeing an ad on a, on a blog. But do you, do you oh. envision it as a self-service? Oh, sorry. Self-service ads or like a network um, of people going out to mine neighborhoods? Like the last presenter uh, was saying for food spotting, we would allow them to have access uh, for a fee, and then we would have someone who would approve those ads so it would go into the queue, and we would decide whether or not it should go up or not. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. And our final company, which is bringing TV to the web, is SetJam, represented by Ryan Jansen and June Simmons. How many of you out there have heard of Hulu? Can you raise your hands? Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. How many have heard of Crackle or Epix? Not that many, right? <laughs> Did you know that only 20% of online TV and less than 10% of online movies are actually hosted on Hulu. The fact is that online TV is hugely fragmented, and that fragmentation is only accelerating. New networks like Epix are coming online. Comcast, the cable operator, is bringing their TV online. The sports leagues like NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, golf, tennis, they're all coming online too, and they've all got their own websites. Now, you probably didn't know this, but more importantly, you probably don't care. All you want to do is watch your TV wherever it is. What you need is a tool that knows your favorite shows and goes out on the internet and brings them to you. Well, that's exactly the tool that we've built at SetJam. It's a simple, specialized search engine that remembers your shows and transforms what is collectively the largest library of full-length TV shows and movies in the entire world into your personal entertainment center. I'm Ryan Jansen. I'm the former chief operating officer of angelsoft.net. I spent the last five years meritocratizing the early stage investment industry. That's June Simmons. She's our former vice president of usability. And we're now part of an eight-person startup based here in New York. And our sole mission is to make online TV as easy as traditional TV. Let's take a look at how close we've come. When you come to SetJam, you'll see a simple search box where you can add any TV show or movie ever made. Select the show to see where it's available online. Our search results will show you every episode ever created with the most recent at the top. You can hover over an episode to see a screenshot and a synopsis. Now, the best thing about SetJam is you never have to worry about where your shows are again. We evaluate every content provider on an objective basis and show you the best link across three business models, for free ad-supported, to buy, or as part of an existing subscription like Netflix. Now, the cool, one of the coolest things you can do here is actually filter your shows just by streaming only or just by free only, too, if that's all you care about. 
Now, one of the best things about SetJam is building your online TV queue. Now, we'll never ask you to create another account at SetJam. But if you want to create a queue, we'll ask you to, ask you to authenticate through Facebook so we can remember who you are. Dude, let's go to streaming only and check out a recent episode of 30 Rock on Amazon. Now, I know a lot of you have probably never done video on demand online before, but it's actually very simple and it works just like any other streaming site. Your show sure starts agreed. immediately. Assuming nothing goes wrong in the next eight hours. Jaden Ms. Michael Lemon, Tyler don't compete will with be me. the next TGS cast member. And, uh, and after two minutes, you can actually just pay for it if you want to continue watching. Done. Another cool thing you can actually see here is this is our attempt to help make TV a little more social. So if the set jam bar at the top while you're watching, you can actually update your Facebook status or check out what other people are watching as well. So let's go back to set jam. So the cool thing is we don't only have TV shows. We also have the largest library of online movies in the entire world as well. And if you've got an account at Netflix, you can actually watch your shows there just like any other streaming site. Now, the first time you go to Netflix, we'll take you there to authenticate. But because we use OAuth, we actually never have to remember your credentials, uh, and we never have to take you there again. This is 2001 A Space Odyssey. It is my favorite movie of all time. I'm not just doing this for uh, the dramatic effect, but given the kind of revolution that this TV industry is undergoing right now, I think it's really appropriate. <laughs> All right, let's go back to set jam. I want to show you one last feature that we just introduced, and that's the ability, we've actually opened up our entire database of online TVs and movies for you to browse. Now, I will admit that I built this feature for the Googlebot. The Googlebot is a very important customer, customer of ours, and uh, he loves online indexes. But it's actually fascinating to see that right now, there are over 4,000 movies that you can watch online today. And that actually almost 700 of them are completely free. People, I am a TV junkie. And I can tell you that SetJam is the easiest way online to manage your TV life. Fortunately, you do not have to take my word for it. As of today, I am excited to announce and a little bit terrified to say that SetJam is finally available in a public beta. There's a lot of work for us to do still, but if you'd like to help us define the future of online TV, you can just go to www.setjam.com, and if you'd actually like, like, like to follow our progress as a startup, you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Starcat. All right, uh, you get points for enthusiasm and again, an awesome presentation. I feel like you needed a headset though. Yeah, uh, I want one of those, right? <laughs> <laughs> Set it and forget it. Uh, in, in a certain way, and I don't mean this as a, as a harsh criticism, but as an observation, this is a step sideways or backwards in terms of where people view these experiences. There's so many apps and boxes trying to get TV off the computer screen and onto the back onto the big screens that we're all paying a lot of money for. What's your plan to maybe work with a Boxy or get on the Xbox Live or get, you know, I'd love to watch these free streaming movies on a screen that uh, is worthy of them. Yeah, absolutely, it's a great question. Um, so it's funny, people actually think that uh, Boxy and like Apple TV are the things that are hooked up to people's TVs. There are actually 10 more Mac, 10 times more Mac minis hooked up to TVs right now. And there are actually 10 times more more PCs than Mac Minis hooked up to TVs. What we believe, and it's absolutely the case, I can just promise you, mm -hmm. is that people want the full internet on their TVs. They're not going to live in sandboxes in five years from now, or even this year. 5% of all TVs shipped this year have internet connections right on them with a full browser. So SetJam's bet on the web, right? And SetJam, if you look at the user interface and you actually use it, um, I have a Mac Mini hooked up to my TV with a DeNovo Mini keyboard that has a little trackpad and that kind of stuff. Um, it is designed for the big screen experience. It feels very much like a directory. The fonts are all very big. So it's actually already designed for the yeah. big screen. It's how I watch TV online. I've actually canceled my cable subscription. Um, and uh, it, it works great. I think it's designed for the future. There are a lot of startups out there who deal with movies and online content, mine being one of them. Uh, <laughs> fight, 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 fight. 
food fight. Uh, and, and, and you're solving uh, an interesting problem that, that certainly we have, which is sort of knowing where movies are online for people to watch that are already licensed, right? That are already legal, that people can, can view. So how do you intend on uh, working with me? <laughs> and, and, you know, other, other folks. Well, Nate, you know, I mean, it's a very, very big industry, you know. Any clip is a brilliant product, and we'd be thrilled to work with keep you. Going, keep going, keep um, going. No, you know, you guys are doing actually a very specific piece of indexing and getting meta metadata about TV, right? So our companies are very similar. We're all about the metadata. So, you know, that set jam bar that I showed you, like, I envision that someday of just being, like, really gnarly, right? Like, where there's all sorts of data streaming out of this where you can click down and see who the actors are. So you can see who's saying what or what scene or skip to a certain scene or whatever else, right? So the kind of indexing you're doing on a show-based basis really could tie into this platform and, 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 you know, make this sort of something really cool the, and sort of take us to the next yeah, level I, of online I, I didn't make, mean to make it about me. I more meant to make it about you and how do you... Just in general, your data asset. You meant to make it about you. Yeah, uh, I meant, how do you how do you intend on do you intend on using your data asset for other folks? Not how would you use my well, data asset? You know, for like I said, I, I don't know how this is ultimately going to play out, right? Um, but one thing that we're certainly going to do is, you know, I'm not naive enough as an entrepreneur to believe that I'm going to build a site that's going to bring in a hundred million users, which is the kind of thing this is going to have to scale to to be a really profitable business. So we've designed this. As uh, to be light from the very beginning. So I'm already working on partnerships with existing entertainment sites where I can be their TV and movie uh, search engine for them, right? So, and there's all sorts of cool little widgets we could have. Like, so like say they're writing an article on a particular uh, show, I can have a watch it now button, right? And because I can actually semantically parse what they're writing, I can, I can have the right link right there so that someone can just click that button and watch a TV show right now. So I think there's actually tons of ways to bring our data out through an API, through widgets, into other people's sites. I mean, maybe if you could tell a little bit more about where you envision this going. I know you link into Facebook, but what kind of social features and community features and interaction you expect to have, or if that's not going to be, if it's just purely going to be a guide? Well, you know, once again, I'm, a, I'm an empirical software de developer. I don't, I don't uh, uh, try to guess what my users want. I've put out what I think is a very bare bones sort of suggestive product. Right? We've got core search, and we do it better than anyone else in the world. We've got a gesture to the social features to see how people respond to them. So I'm really going to listen to our users. And if you want me to take a guess, which I don't really like to do, um, you know, I've asked around a little bit. I think that you know, uh, it's going to be so doing social TV is very hard. So I think it's actually about one-to-one -one recommendations. I think that probably the problem is broadcasting to your social network. Like, you know, if I like a particular episode of something, like sometimes I just want to be like everyone in the world, like, oh my God, you got to go check this out, right? But more often it's like, oh my God, you know, my best friend over here, he would think that was so funny, right? So it's actually that one-to-one -one sort of interpersonal sharing. So I think that's probably where the social features are going to go. Good recommendation. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for uh, attending Launchpad. We now have one final component of it where we're just going to try and figure out wh who the audience thinks has the best chance of success, which product uh, do you think will make it? Starting with, if you wouldn't mind standing up just so they face. Nope. Just clap. Uh, our first presenters for, or yes, we're going to do clap. We didn't tell them the metric. Sorry, the metric is clapping. <laughs> Uh, oh, the noise is good. Noise is good. <laughs> they are developing real-time data services for developers. Abstrata. Clap for the cloud. Go cloud. And the ticket. Abstraction of the cloud. EarthAid, which is hoping to be mint.com for your utilities. Clap, clap, clap. That was a tie. Food spotting, which is trying to get as granular as possible with uh, restaurants and food. <laughs> Neighborhooder, a uh, hyperlocal blog network built on Tumblr. <laughs> and SetJam, TV for the web. No idea. Yeah, they all sounded <laughs> like I think it was a little quieter on neighborhood or no offense. But like, <laughs> everything else sounded exactly the same. 
Um, yeah, Earth, I'd something? say Earth Aid sounded a little bit. Yeah, yeah. people love that. I think Earth Aid and yeah. Set Jim sort of had louder. So t- louder sitting on your too. ass and watching TV versus saving the planet. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Those are our choices. <laughs> And, and even you're, cupcakes. Yeah, you're using you're a low power consuming uh, yeah, yeah. Mac Mini to watch your TV. <laughs> <laughs> and you can feel better about it. And you can take pictures via food spotting of the cupcakes you're consuming while you're doing that. <laughs> well, all hosted. Let me, the this is all this data is stored on Upstrata. While you blog about what neighborhood you're in. <laughs> let me say something about, I mean, this applies to everyone because I don't think you start a business if, if you don't go after this one thing, but the, the one thing about EarthAid and SetJam uh, is that they're both going after huge, huge markets that are in tremendous amount of disruption right now. And neighborhood is similar to that because of what's going on in, in media, but especially with what's happening, and maybe I'm a bit more sensitive to it with online video and, and streaming, but then of course our energy markets um, these are tremendously, tremendously huge uh, markets, and they're and they're sort of both going straight to the the center of it and doing something pretty disruptive. So, good luck. Yeah, yeah. and I thought they were all very well done in yeah. terms of presenting. Was. Learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I think we'll we'll call it a tie between Earth Aid and Set Jam. And I would just like to thank people involved in the program, Megan Riley, Natalia Duganzik, uh, ETS, and our judges, and our presenters. Thank you very much. <laughs>